Hey folks, this is Alexander Wynn. And I am Lacey Hannon. And we are here with The Synthesis, the show where we talk about entertainment and how it incorporates real science and history. Woohoo! We are here with the uh, third of one episode of The Martian, <laughs> the film, because Lacey and I don't know how to shut up about The Martian, I apparently. Yes not so we're we, trying though we, i promise we've made a vow to ourselves that this is going to be the end so no, I you make, can look forward to four or five more episodes no i make this vow to you that this is the end this is this, <laughs> this is, is the this end. is it All right. um, um we are picking up with the last third of the martian the film so we are picking up right at the moment of the time jump which is a very nice convenient little breaking yeah. point in the story and we are going to see Mark head to Scaparelli Crater and get up off of the surface of Mars and eventually see if he makes it home. Yes. So I think that maybe instead of going through each plot point, mm -hmm. we should try and give it a, let's do the plot points up front and then just talk about it. All right. Do we want to do that? We'll, we'll or do you want to save that for next time? Let, let's save that for next time because all my notes are like in <laughs> linear order. So oh, I don't well, know how to. Yeah. We did. Oh, so I'm just going to put this out there. Now that we've gotten our feet totally wet with this podcast and this show, um, we are going to try and switch up a little bit how we present um, the stories and the information. Um, we've, been, we've been recapping too much yeah. and commenting too and little. It's, and it's not like you haven't read it or seen it or whatever. So yeah. why do we need to do that? Um, and as part of that, if you have suggestions on content or um, how we present the show, you know, that sort of thing. Let us know. Mm -hmm. We're here to listen. We got a couple people telling us uh, mm -hmm. last week which what they would like to see us cover. Yep. So we are listening. Excellent suggestions all. Yes. All right. All right. So we pick up and uh, there has been a time jump. And the first thing that I uh, found myself wondering is, was there a time jump in the book? I don't think there was. I think the book walks us through there the whole process, right? There was a little bit of one yeah. um, because we, um, yeah, there he, were doesn't, he doesn't do the entire trek. Well, there, there are points the where we're sort of jumping, you know, like we, we don't hear from him for 10 days or whatever, but I feel like there's never like a moment where we go from this period of time to the next period of time where we skip a bunch. I think that the book pretty much follows him the whole time, right? I, I don't entirely think so. I think there okay. is one big jump, but not yeah, not, like not this. this big. Yeah. Um, I will say my my first yeah. thought here yeah. is how I mean he's tiny. This yeah. man is tiny, but holy crap, skinny Mark. But really, I want to know: is that his real beard, <laughs> or is that a wig? It's <laughs> really bad. He got a bad beard. And. And not that the wig would be bad. It's just that he has a bad beard. And I yeah. just want to know, is does this go for like all blonde men? Pretty much every blonde man I've ever met cannot grow a beard to save his life. I've definitely seen thick blonde beards. Like they, they exist in the world, you know. Maybe just in Norway. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. But I need, <laughs> I need proof. <laughs> proof of concept because this man has yeah. a terrible beard he's got a real bad beard and he's got real bad hygiene i like the fact that they took matt damon who is like you know super handsome and super you know big heartthrob and they were willing to make him kind of gross Wait. for the last third <laughs> I have a question what who have you asked if he's a huge heartthrob that's is, like this, is that your opinion no that's like his brand like he's he he's a big leading man handsome guy leading, like that's leading man and handsome guy but it, that's a little yeah. different than heartthrob when you say heartthrob i think devin sawa he was a heartthrob. Girls had huge crushes on him. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how many <laughs> people have Matt Damon on their on their wall in middle school. They but I don't think most women have him as a hall pass. Yeah, just know. what I'm putting out there. Maybe it's just my mom. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I uh, did but not yeah, I that. I like that he's you know he's a he's a good looking guy. He's a leading man, and he was willing, and they were willing to make him just kind of gross. Like he's got you know, sores all over his body and he's very malnourished and his teeth look terrible. Like he clearly, oh. that's something that they didn't really address in the book is that he had a limited supply of like toothpaste. Right. So and, well, and nutrients are going to totally factor in because yeah. what, I mean, the reason pirates had beer was pretty much, I mean, 
other than pirates want alcohol. Yeah. But a lot of times it was so that the captain could get them the nutrients they needed so that they wouldn't get, what was the disease? That it's, they not, it's not beer. Uh, I think you're thinking of scurvy, which comes from a lack of uh, vitamin like C. Vitamins, and yeah. so they would often have like basically rancid lime juice. But no, uh, no, no. Uh, when we were drink. in New Zealand, they talked yeah. about how Captain Cook yeah. made New Zealand's oh, they first ha- beer. Yeah, they made some, but it was a special kind of beer. It wasn't just wheat. He, it was like a beer made from from citrus fruits or something yeah, because yeah. it because had that yeah, property. Yeah, because of scurvy. So anyway, this man has scurvy. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Um, because even your vitamins aren't going to be able to totally cover, totally that, cover yeah. all of it. But as a daughter of a dental hygienist, you guys, I cannot look at bad teeth. I cannot, I cannot look at bad teeth. And so he was very hard to wash. Yeah. Sh- for the last portion of this movie. Probably also very hard to wash. <laughs> Thank um. you for pointing out that I have. Listen, <laughs> I'm very congested. I'm yeah. still. Uh, uh, he, we do very quickly get to a moment that is a lot of people's, uh, you know, very memorable line, which is the space pirate line. <laughs> uh, and this is another one of those things. We talked uh, a couple of episodes ago. This is one of those things that they kept in the movie, despite the fact that they removed the justification for it. It no longer makes sense, but they kept it in the movie because it's a good line. Uh, he talks about how he's going to be commandeering the uh, Ares for Mav, and he, Mars is technically international waters, and that makes him a space pirate. But the trick here, the thing that they're missing is that in the book, he lost contact with Earth. So so nobody could give him permission to do this. Right. Whereas in the movie, he never loses contact with Earth, so they could just give him permission. Like, that's not actually, it, do, it no longer makes sense because of the changes that they made to the film. But, you know, it's a great line. So. I have, I had a moment of, he's the first guy to do pretty much everything on Mars. I mm-hmm. mean, really. And have you ever, have you ever, have, I don't know. This is, this is kind of weird, but I've been doing it ever since I was a little kid. Be weird, babe. Go for it. <laughs> Thank you. I believe in you. Um, which is, I, you know, I'll be walking somewhere. Like, I grew up near the woods and in the woods, whatever. And I would be walking through the woods and I'd be like, I might be the first person who's ever stepped on this part of what? I'm sorry. You were like, I was raised by the woods, in the woods, by wild creatures. It doesn't matter. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was raised in the Wolves. woods. I was, yeah. I, I was suckled by a she-wolf. I founded Rome. <laughs> And, That's right. you know, it's, it's no big deal. It's uh, whatever. I've been um, around the block yeah. a few times. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and the world. Um, anyway, so I would be walking through the woods and I'd be like, I'm the first, per- maybe I'm the first person who's ever stepped foot on this spot. Oh, no, I did that for right? sure. Yeah. Like, I yeah. feel like that's a pretty normal thing. I would even do it in like the fun zone, though, which is just totally bizarre. Like, you're, you're like, like a fun pl- flex sort of. You're like walking through the mall going, I wonder if anyone's ever stood on this spot. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, no, not it. not in nature. It would, it, it's yeah. very weird. But I feel like there would be a certain there'd be a certain point at which you'd stop doing that on Mars because you're like, yep, I'm still the fucking first. Well, he's got a whole monologue about how everywhere I go, I'm the first. Yeah, and that's yeah. And it seems like it'd get highly boring. And mm-hmm. it's one way that you would you would lose the sentimentality of being mm-hmm. there. And as a sentimental person, I really kind of struggled with the w- the way in the book he, you know, he's leaving Mars mm-hmm. and he's like, fuck you, Mars. Yeah. Right. And I, I'm like, I hear you. I understand this actually is totally logical, but yeah. I, as a sentimental person, yeah. don't know how, like, I can't wholly swallow that. <laughs> um, but it's, it is actually starting to sink in a little bit that yeah. holy buckets, like, let's. Yeah get off this off rusty this rock. rock. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we do, so pretty quickly, he's leaving for Scaparelli. Uh, we get that everywhere I go, I'm the first uh, monologue. But there is an interesting thing that I actually have never noticed in any of the times that I've watched The Martian, which is you know somewhere in the 600s, uh, that Lacey pointed out, which is that the, in the I book- I have a habit of doing this. She's I like very smart. I, it's yeah. really awesome. I just <laughs> seriously, like- you guys, it's a real shame that you can't marry her because I married her first. So anyway, uh, Lacey pointed out that in the book he has two rovers and he does different things with different rovers and he ends up turning one of them into sort of a trailer. Uh, and in the movie, one of the, tra- one of the rovers is wrecked. 
there's no salvaging that. Yeah. And we talked early on during the movie of, oh, that's interesting because he, I'm pretty sure he does do the trailer at the end. So he must have like fixed the rover or something, except if you watch closely in this sequence, it's a custom trailer. Like that, that is not a rover that is hooked to the back of the, of the primary just, rover. He just made a thing. Yeah, he made a whole new, a whole new trailer yeah. out of, out of like spare parts that NASA totally sent to Mars. Yeah, like, like I, I'm, so I'm bizarre. curious to know what the design was because that was clearly a decision. Like they had to make the rover and then they had to make a separate thing. And I'm curious, like if, if there's a deleted scene somewhere where he's like welding pieces that he stripped off of the MAV or something, you know, it's, uh, it's an interesting choice, but yeah, very uh, impressive. I didn't, I didn't love the choice because it didn't make sense to me. Yeah. Where did he come up with all of these parts and mm -hmm. he's building a whole new thing and yeah. gosh, like and this like man maybe shouldn't be doing extra physical labor if he doesn't have to be. And right? like maybe it's not actually custom. It, it's not a rover, but like there's, there's always the possibility that that was sent with the rovers and that that was like sort of a, a basically a trailer. Like they're going to go out and collect rocks and this is the thing that's going to carry the rocks because we know that the rover in the movie is smaller than the rover in the book. So maybe this is sort of the cargo thing for the rover. I don't know, but yeah, it's a it's an odd choice. Um, I feel like so one of the things I really like about this movie is the music. Yes. There's something very aspirational about it, while also having gravitas, which is an interesting balance. Yeah, it has a it has a lot of sort of contradictory elements that yeah. that work. It's it's sort of lonesome, but it's also encouraging. It's very high tech, but it's also very kind of mellow. It's somehow energizing and relaxing at the same time. I, I adore the soundtrack to The Martian. And I think part of why it works so well is because it fits with the landscape. Yes. They, it, you get tons of these beautiful landscapes in this portion of the film. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, you know, it's kind of like going to the Grand Canyon. We've all seen pictures of it. But when you're standing in front of it, it's a whole different thing, yeah, it's right? it's different. And it's bizarre and otherworldly and gorgeous. And there's there's something kind of uplifting about being allowed to have this in our lives, right? And I feel like that's that, to me, is the music yeah. of Mars, is that there's something aspirational about it. And also, holy crap, what made that, Yeah, <laughs> you know? It's actually, this is something that I've said before and I continue to say, uh, I am a huge fan of the Mars trilogy of novels by Kim Stanley Robinson. And for my money, the only way to read the Mars trilogy is while listening to the soundtrack to The Martian. It is the perfect pairing because it has that aspirational sort of futuristic feel, but it is also lonely. It really, the, yeah. the soundtrack of this movie really captures the fact that he is alone. This is an endless desert with nothing except for him. And it really has that sense of emptiness except for him. Mm -hmm. And the, the prologue of Red Mars talks about that. It, that is the theme on which the Mars trilogy begins, is this idea that Mars was empty before we came. That this was a, a blank canvas and then humans came and we brought our stories and we brought our history and we brought our our communities and we filled up this world with our life and it's it's just perfect and you know like like you were saying the the music really captures the vistas and yeah. a lot of the Mars trilogy book is kind of just driving through landscape there's a lot of kind of boring parts where they're just talking about and then they drove by this crater and then they drove by this crater and then they drove by this crater and it's really boring unless you're listening to the soundtrack to The Martian, and then it is beautiful. You can just see it all, and it's it's captivating. You just want to drive. So I will say that I haven't been able to get through the Mars trilogy. I will someday because I made a promise to Alex, and he got through. <laughs> I haven't you got made four promises to Alex. You, we we oh. have been trading books. Hey, I'll read this if you read that. Hey, I'll read this if you read that, and I keep reading the book. And Lacey keeps not reading the Mars trilogy. <laughs> I'm tr listen. I think it's really boring, and I know that there are parts that are interesting. I just, I, to me, it doesn't connect enough. Whatever. We're not talking about the Mars trilogy. Whatever. We're not talking about it. 
<laughs> but <laughs> I will say that listening to the Martian um, uh, soundtrack, the no, not soundtrack. Yeah, uh, soundtrack. Yeah. Okay. Well, whatever. Um, score. Ah. Sorry, we have to differentiate because I have something else about the soundtrack. Okay. The score, listening to it while driving just generally is pretty awesome if you have a problem to figure out yes. or if you're trying to mull over a story and be creative i will tell you we have listened to it on many a road trip and it is top notch for that work watching the the mountains roll by in colorado or watching the desert roll by in arizona and just listening to the martian or the semis in nebraska or the semis in nebraska <laughs> <laughs> yeah um I will say that one of the things that they do in this that I don't enjoy mm -hmm. is it feels like they use the soundtrack, the disco music, yeah. as filler. And it bothers me. Mm -hmm. um, it, they, I talked in the last episode about how they kind of use it for comedic relief, whereas yeah. in the book, you get Mark Watney as comedic relief. And that's just going to be difference of mediums. You can't hear the music that he's listening to, like you might have that song memorized, but you're not keeping it going in the background, right? Not so Not while you're reading. Yeah. Not while you're reading. So he he's the comedic relief, and it's part of what we love about the book. Mm -hmm. They kind of lose that in the movie. They replace it with the disco music, which I'm just like, okay, it, it, it keeps the movie lighthearted, but we lose a part of his personality, and we get a little too much disco music which i i don't mind disco music i just that's not what i'm there for and i i just found that they used it too often i th i think that it did a valuable thing which is you know mark is fundamentally an upbeat guy mark is somebody who will approach any problem from a sort of a proactive can do optimistic standpoint but a lot of what he does especially in the book but even in the movie is fundamentally boring like, there is an extended sequence where he's laying dirt on the ground. You know, there's another extended sequence where he's just taking furniture out of a room. And these are not interesting things to watch. And I feel like the disco music did a good job of not only sort of specifying the story. This is, this is a story beat. It's not just like they found music to just plug into the movie. This is relevant to the story that they are telling. But it also keeps the energy up. You know, we're, we're coming up on this on this sequence where he's stripping the MAV and it's set to Waterloo, which is a very upbeat kind of fun song, which is not the tone of a guy ripping chairs off the ground. Like that's, I mean, it, it I shifts the tone to it. I guess the best way I can put it is it puts you in the same place that Mark is. That music sort of sets the tone of what I feel like it's like to be in Mark Watney's brain which is that it's just, yeah, we're doing it. We're, we're being proactive. We're high energy and we're gonna attack the problem. Whereas- I, It makes me kind of wish that we had montages in real life. I know, right? But Seriously. I, I don't know that we're going to agree on this. I will say this, as he's approaching the MAV, I don't know why this line gets me so much, but it does. Every single time he says it, I laugh out loud. It's when he's talking about the plan with the stripped down MAV and how fast they're gonna go. Uh, and how they're stripping out things and sending him into space under a tarp. And he's, he's just sitting in the rover and he's just sort of airing his grievances about this plan and how insane it is. And at one point he goes, and by the way, physicists, when describing things like acceleration, do not use the word fast. <laughs> and I, just, I just love that sentiment that, you know, they use words like acceleration and velocity and all these sorts of things, and they don't use words like fast fast so uh it's just i don't know I, i've always been kind of a linguistics nerd and one of the things that is interesting to me about the english language is you know english is a germanic language but it has a huge number of latin by way of french words in english mm -hmm. and if if you sort of dig into the history the reason for that is because England was a nation of German speakers, and then the Normans came in with French and conquered it. And so for a long time in English history, what you had was all the educated people spoke French and all the poor people spoke German. And so the, the German language had the inertia to sort of force its word order onto things 
but all the people writing dictionaries were speaking French. And so the words are mostly French, but the language is German. And anyway, this is a You're tangent. Such a nerd. I am such a nerd. But <laughs> here's the cool part. Even today, you can often check whether a word derives from German or French based on how smart it is. Like if you picture a stupid person and a really smart person using synonyms, you know, for example, if you, if you have somebody who went to Harvard and you're describing them, one kind of person might say that guy's real smart and the other kind of person might say that that person is very intelligent. Real smart are German words, very intelligent are French words. I'm and just going to put it out there that not everybody who goes to Harvard is really smart. Or guys. very intelligent. Yeah. Um, so there are, but, but there are all of these cases in English where the sort of less educated version of the word, even today, is the German version of the word. And anyway, this line where he's talking about how physicists describing things like acceleration do not use the word fast. It, <laughs> it sort of speaks to that. Like they use the intelligent word. They don't use fast. And it just tickles the hell out of me um one of the things that i okay one of the things that i don't love and we kind of hit on this last time is that a lot of people don't kind of talk back to their superiors in this movie so we don't yeah. get mindy's fun attitude we don't get any of that but in the same breath we also get something else they don't like which is she is asked hey, what, you know, like, how's he doing? And Venkat means, like, how is he doing mentally? And mm -hmm. I believe it's Venkat who asks her. Mm -hmm. And she said that, you know, he's asking them to call him Captain Blondbeard. And her inference, obviously, is, hey, he's going a little crazy. Yeah. And he, we didn't have that in the movie. And we, we talked about that on mm -hmm. the show of yeah. just how it was kind of nice that we skipped that cliched plot point because even if it's a little true, mm -hmm. duh. Yeah, and of so course he's going a little bit crazy, right. but he's mostly not crazy, and that's what matters. And I, f and I feel like that's just playing down to the audience's expectations rather than playing up to mm -hmm. the author's, you know, the level that the author is playing at. Yeah. And I, I, really, I really hate that. Because we don't, like, audiences aren't stupid. We all know that uh, we'd all go a little crazy out there. Well, it's also, a, it's an interesting question. Is like, you know, obviously the hermit sort of who, who lives alone on the mountaintop is a little bit eccentric. That's, that's a, an archetype yeah, that everybody knows. But it, it is an interesting question. Like, I wonder, being isolated for, like, 10 months, would you get a little eccentric or is that long enough that you would mostly just be lonely but you're still fine you know like that doesn't actually seem like that long you know we're we're here in a pandemic where a lot of people have been quarantining for now over a year and not everybody has roommates now right, obviously they have telecommunications and so they can talk to people but i'm just i wonder how quirky you would get from just 10 months of isolation i mean i think the difference is because i mean he gets to talk to people too but he, you don't get to see people. You're mm -hmm. not, you are actually alone mm -hmm. and incredibly far from people. True. And I think but I, I mean, at the same time, he's watching TV. So he is getting sort of, you know, the, the one-sided interaction with other humans. He's still wa witnessing social encounters and all that sort of thing. I just, I, I'd be curious to talk to a, like a psychiatrist or something and figure out how, what is the progression of, sort of losing your social norms. Well, and I think that's why we kind of, you know, that's why it was kind of great in the book was that we had the psychiatrist in the book who's like, mm -hmm. you know, this is what's healthy and this, is, or the doctor rather, mm -hmm. this is what's healthy and this is what's not. And yeah. we don't see him very often because we don't need to. It's Mark Watney. Yeah. The whole thing about Mark Watney is that he's, he was chosen specifically because this crew could yeah. handle this. Mm -hmm. And Mark of the entire crew can handle it the best. Yeah. So I just don't love that they put it in there because it feels like it feels like playing to the audience in a way that the audience didn't actually need. Yeah. And I and I didn't enjoy that. Well, I'll say, you know, I often struggle to uh, criticize the things that I enjoy, but I will say there is one moment here that I just sort of sigh whenever I see, which is and it's 
fine. Like, I get that I'm in the minority here about people who care, but I do wish that when Mark is throwing things out the window and we are specifically getting shots of big, heavy things falling out the window and falling, you know, that MAV is tall, probably falling yeah. like three stories, something like that. Uh, I wish that they had done a little bit of CGI or just slowed down the footage or something so that they would fall at Martian gravity rates instead of Earth gravity rates. It would have been more I, interesting to watch. Yeah, and like they would have had to explain it. Like I get why they wouldn't. Is a lot of people in the audience would be like, "Why is it falling so slow?" And they would need some exposition to explain it. But I just I have been waiting so many years for a live action thing to depict non Earth gravity, not zero gravity, but non Earth gravity. And the only one that has even come close is uh, the most recent season of The Expanse there are a couple of moments where some characters on the moon will drop something and it'll fall real slowly. But even then, it's sort of a gimmick. It's like one thing falls slowly, but everything else in the environment, you know, their hair, their, their bodies as they walk, and everything, because of course they're filming on Earth. But in this moment, when he is specifically throwing things out the window on Mars, I feel like that would have been a really good moment to just have him toss it and it just falls a little slower than you would have expected and right. lands with a little bit less of a thud just would have been cool so one of the other things here is we have skipped a lot of stuff and i get it you know it's already a two yeah. and a half hour movie yeah it would have been a four hour movie if we did everything but we we skip a lot of things we yeah. skip the pretty much um, the whole journey oh yeah yeah but like even some of the lead up so we um we skipped the building of the rover turning into mm -hmm. the trailer yeah. we skipped the crash yeah. we skipped the um the, the dust, dust storm. storm sequence yeah. yeah um and then we also skipped things like johansson as last woman standing yep and lewis giving beck and johansson her blessing to you know fuck yeah shack up so yeah. like you know there we miss really big plot points mm -hmm. and I almost and some of them they hint at. They do hint at Beck and Johansson's romance. They don't really go into it very much, but it's definitely there in the story. The but like the rover flipping that sort of stuff is apparently just not yeah a thing, which is a shame. Like it would have been interesting to at least hint at it uh, or have sort of a stripped down version of it where like he you know the rover just sort of tips over sort of traditionally like he's driving on an incline and he has to figure out how to get it back up couple of minutes sequence yeah but, but you know this, I, I i like i said i understand it this isn't a james cameron movie where we're going to be sitting in the movie theater for the rest of our lives yeah. but simultaneously they did cut some stuff that i'm yeah interested in and that was a bummer i will say that speaking of the rover mark's goodbye note about the rover gets me every time like i will i will legitimately tear up as he is writing that note whoever sees this, please take care of this rover. It saved my life. Like that is a very powerful moment. And it's especially interesting because, you know, there are a lot of movies and, and stories in general, but especially movies that turn an object into a character. You know, if you watch Firefly, the ship, Serenity, is a character. Like you, you bond with that ship. And there are a lot of stories like that, especially in science fiction. It's often the vehicle that they are in. You know, the Millennium Falcon is a character. And in the, in the sequel trilogy, when the Millennium Falcon shows up, it like gets its own hero shot and all that. And they really didn't do that with the rover in this movie. This yeah. is not a rover that we have come to love or anything, but Mark has. And man, that moment is just really, it's, it's, you know, it's the moment he says thank you to all the equipment that he's been using this whole time, and it's just, damn, well done. Um, we also, so, uh, we see him cry, I think, for yeah. the first time in the movie. Which, which is very cathartic. I liked it. Did you not like it? I won't, uh, my problem with it is that in the movie, we see, or in the book, we, he talks about crying multiple times. Yeah. And I love that. I yeah. love that this is a man that is partially capable of withstanding mm -hmm. this emotional travesty yeah. because he lets himself feel it and express it and all of that. Whereas in the movie... He's, he's cried a few times in the movie. 
Wow. Yeah, yeah, he 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 definitely gets choked up when he first receives the message from Vincent. He he gets he he has some sniffles and stuff. Uh, and depending on how you define cry, he cries in pain at the beginning when he's inhaled, no, and he cries uh, in frustration when the potatoes are all killed. I, I'll give you the potatoes, not the yeah. pain though, because to me, the right. th that, yeah, that's, that's a different, different thing. thing. But but no, he definitely gets choked up when he's talking to I, NASA. That I really like about how he says that he's crying. Mm -hmm. There's something, uh, I think that there's something really healthy about portraying someone who not only cries but admits it. Yeah. And 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 a guy and who a cries. Guy. Yeah. And that's yeah. sorry. Th that was un that was unsaid by me, but that's exactly what I was talking about. I know it was. That's <laughs> why I went out of my way to be the one to say it. <laughs> but like, I I think it's important, and they removed the second step of it. Yeah. Um, he has enough times in the movie where he's talking to his GoPro or whatever yeah. that I think something a line should have been in there because I think it's I think it's important. Yeah. Um. Anyway, so I. And and the other thing about crying is, I did not cry in this movie nearly as much as I did in the book. Yeah. This movie does not emotionally affect me the way that mm -hmm. the book does. I feel like that's pretty much always true, though, right? Like, has there ever been a book that you were more effect emotionally affected by the movie than by the book? Hell if I know. I don't. Yeah. Like, the I don't. I'm not one of those people who keeps track of the movies. Yeah. versus the book. The only thing that I can think of that was more impactful than than the book are specific moments in Lord of the Rings. There are moments in the films that are incredibly powerful that were not that powerful in the book because they just sort of weren't meant to be. Um, or, or you know, the music and the cinematography all comes together in I a would way say that, that the description doesn't. But the book overall, I would say, is much more emotionally impactful than the movie. I don't know that I... I I felt that way because I've only read one of them. Yeah. See, this is another one that she was supposed to read in a book exchange and she only read the first one. I'll, I'll get there. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I in, the, in the movies, I do I do cry quite a yeah. bit for those. And I, th I feel like a lot of that has to do with Tolkien being poetic yeah. in a way that can kind of remove you from the emotion of it. Hmm. Uh, anyway, uh, I just wanted to put it out there. We, I do appreciate in the world of being accurate to the book, we got a cameo by the five-sided bolt that he gets fixated on when his brain is being deprived of oxygen. He definitely, there is a bolt that is flying around. That being said, Mark, clean up after yourself because there is not one bolt flying around inside that cabin. There are like 60 bolts flying around inside that cabin. Yeah. And like, what were you thinking, man? These are dangerous hazards. Like, Beck is going to have to come in here and get you, and there's shit flying around <laughs> everywhere. Yeah. I feel like they l they overdid it a little bit with the swirling debris. They it did. It starts to speak poorly of Mark's cleaning skills. But you know what scientific, because that's just like a, that's scientifically totally inaccurate. Every yeah. scientist knows you would not go into, you would not launch yourself into space with this much space stuff around stuff right just yeah you would you would sweep up and get the bolts out of there and like yeah yeah exactly um one of the things that i appreciated from them yeah. is when martinez says it's fighting me yes um because he he's the one piloting the map or the mav sorry if i'm not supposed Either to one. okay um he's the one piloting it but we don't see him physically react to it fighting him because you wouldn't. Yeah, the joystick but isn't moving in his hand. Yeah. Like, yeah. But you would see that in a lesser or older yeah. movie. And yeah. I appreciated that we didn't have that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was surprised. It's a cliche that we're so used to seeing that I absolutely expected it and was totally like, ready okay. to be annoyed yeah. and then it didn't happen and I was like oh good for you guys this is actually it's a very subtle change but this is actually one thing that I prefer over in the movie as opposed to the book as much as I love the line from Martinez in the book where he says it was like flying a cow uh, or something like that in the movie I really appreciate the way the actor playing Martinez plays this moment because he's piloting the the MAV and somebody, I, I forget, maybe Lewis, asks him, like, you know, why, why is it not going better? And his response is, it's, it's fighting me. And it's this kind of, like, un, 
understated, quiet, just kind of like, yeah, I'm, yeah, kind of thing. And it feels more professional. It feels like a guy who is focused on a task and he's good at what he does and he, he can't figure out exactly what's happening, but he's not engaging you in conversation. He's focused. Yeah, and because oftentimes when they do it, it's panic. Like the, that person yeah, exactly. yelling and fighting with the, the yeah. machinery and there's either panic, there's fear or anger. Yeah. And I feel like it's it's what you were just saying. In a in a lesser version of this movie, Martinez would have been like, ah, come on! Yeah. And he's not. He's a professional. He's doing a thing. He's not on the ship. Like, everything around him is still. He's just focused. And yeah. that is good. That is, he's that in is the, the right choice. Yeah. Um, there, the, uh, I don't remember where it is, but uh, Lewis, oh, it's, a, it's, a, it's about... It's right here where um, Lewis says, keep it together, work the problem. Yeah. And I was just like, God, that should just be the mantra of life. Yeah. Um, keep calm, carry on. But yeah, yeah keep but we're so annoyed by that at yeah. this point. Um, work the problem. Brain. Yeah. Well, yeah. and it, it's a subtly different message. It's not just carry on, which means like endure. It's yeah. work the problem, find a solution. And I, I feel like I need to write it, like paint it, maybe even on a wall, just yeah. Keep it together. Work yeah. the problem. Yeah. And then later, once the problem is fixed, then you can break down and cry about it and do the healthy emotional thing. Yep. And then y you move on again. Yep. <laughs> um, we should put anyway. that on a shirt. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we do have, this is one of those moments, uh, I don't think anybody is particularly surprised, but this is the sequence where they shift things around considerably to make Lewis the hero which, you know, is understandable. Uh, uh, I, yeah. I sort of prefer the book version because I like her being the leader, not the hero, yeah. which is a distinction that is not often made in Hollywood. Uh, you know, to me, she does get credit for saving Mark, despite the fact that it was Beck that went out and got Mark because he was operating under her orders. But it's Hollywood. We need, we need you know, Jessica Chastain to actually go out and do it with her hands. Well, there are so. two other things that happened right around there that yeah. I thought was good on the on the filmmakers mm -hmm. before we get to the ending. Yeah. So we don't see how fast the Hermes is going, and there is a point where it kind of undercuts the tension. Yeah. Um, because trying to really get an eye for like why is this so hard? Yeah. You know, we've been we've already been told. You know, it's like however it's sixty eight kilometers or whatever mm -hmm. from. Uh, I'm talking about the Mav being about 68 kilometers from the oh. Hermes, yeah. right? But we don't see how fast either of them are moving, and so it undercuts that tension. But simultaneously, it's so it's accurate. So mm -hmm. I still appreciate it. Yeah. Um, and it is actually there if you look for it. It's a subtle thing, but uh, I I noticed as we were watching that it'll cut to the Hermes and it's just against the black of space and there's no context there. And then it'll cut to the Mav and Mars under the Mav, like like the, the background of the shot is rotating fast. Like those those surface features are moving past the, the screen pretty quickly, which of course doesn't mean that Mars is rotating fast. It means they are moving quickly around that planet. Which they are hauling ass in the orbit around Mars. Which is the only visual cue that they really can have right. for this. I mean, and I'm sure you could most put people plumes of right, you know, like yeah. But I'm sure most people read it as the planet rotating instead of them moving. But still, I didn't yeah. even really notice. Yeah. Mars behind it. I was more focused on what was in yeah. the foreground. Yeah. So, you know, for me, it, I, I have no idea really what you're talking about. Right. Um, but the other thing that I really liked is, and this is one of those super, hu like, human things, which yeah, is... Not superhuman, but yeah, just super, super human. Human. Yeah. Space, <laughs> not dash. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, that Watney sparks an idea for Lewis. The one of the best things about a team and having having multiple people in a room working a problem together, having a diverse team working together, is you've got peop people just set off ideas for mm -hmm. each other. And y it's, again, working that problem. So Watney says, hey, I'll be Iron Man. Mm -hmm. And Lewis is like... <laughs> it's a quintessentially Mark Watney thing yeah. to say. And, and Lewis is, is no, don't, yeah. <laughs> you're, don't do that. But it gives her an idea of how to 
essentially make the Hermes the mm -hmm. larger version of iron the Iron Man suit idea, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't know. I've I've always been fascinated by the way brains work because <laughs> brains it's not just it's not always logical jumps that get us from one idea to the next. You know, they just mm -hmm. they kind of set off yeah. in weird ways. And for me, it often makes me very emotional. <laughs> just like I can get very into watching people just problem solve and Be brainstorm smart. together. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is this is one of those moments where I'm just like thinking about it, not really in the movie itself, but thinking about it, it yeah. gets me a little choked up. Yeah. But it didn't in the movie, which is just <laughs> kind of funny. There is this is the scene that I often point to as this is a, another one of those little sort of not exactly a pet peeve, but one of those things that I really want to see in movies like The Martian Gravity is accurate representations of depressurization. This is a thing whenever I watch oh, a yes. sci-fi movie, <laughs> Lacey has heard this a lot, <laughs> uh, where you'll see, you know, the, the Starship Enterprise or whatever, there'll be a hole blown in the wall and then the, the characters will like grab onto something and it's like there's a hurricane in the room and all this air is blowing out the thing and they're like, ah, and they're holding on and maybe their feet are like waving in the air like a flag as the air is flowing out and it's just like a hurricane and it'll go on for minutes. That is not what depressurization would be like. The best description I've ever heard for what it would be like to be in a decompressing space, you know, vessel is like you're being, it's like you're inside a balloon that pops. It's not a blowing sensation. It's a single blast, and then you are in vacuum. There is no more air. Bam, and it's gone. And that is how it is portrayed in The Martian. When they blow the, the VAL on the Hermes, there's this you know, there's an explosion on the door and then it cuts to various rooms inside the ship and all the air just goes <laughs> and then it's silent. There's just like a wall of air that blasts out the door and then it's done. It's the end. The, it doesn't blow air for a really long time. And that is, you know, even The Expanse, which holds itself up as a pretty, uh, a pretty scientifically accurate show, it does the damn hurricane thing and I so appreciate that they didn't do it here. I've heard this so many times. Yeah. I've heard it. <laughs> you guys, it makes me laugh. Um, before we move on, yeah. I would like to address the question in the chat. Okay. Um, do you know what the soundtrack would be to narrate your life? Or who would compose or write it? I'm, I'm, I'm not going to lie. It might be the soundtrack of The Martian. Like, there's... Soundtrack? The score of or The Martian. Or the score. Hey, yeah. this is... It's worth knowing. There's no version of this where the soundtrack of my life is disco music. Well, I don't <laughs> think so either. See, for me, I have I have a problem because I feel like I have two options, yeah. but one of them isn't going to mesh very well. Okay, so I, I feel like The Secret Life of Walter Mitty has a lot of it, yeah. but I, I live my life a little bit bigger than that yeah. soundtrack is sometimes. That so I feel folksy like... Folksy music is a little small. Yeah, know. so I feel like it would have to be combined with the Kingsman. <laughs> <laughs> like, That's an interesting spread. <laughs> right, exactly. So it might not actually work very well yeah. in terms of... Um, what you're saying is that you, the soundtrack of your life isn't particularly good. Like, <gasps> it's it doesn't mesh Shut well. It. No, I'm not. I wasn't done. <laughs> okay. Okay? Listen, it's either that and, and a for someone who's better at music than me, makes it work, or it's just the Ted Lasso. Yeah, like season. Ted Lasso's good. Yeah. yeah. I For me, Harry Gregson Williams, who did The Martian, is almost certainly it. Uh, but yeah, for me, The Martian, I feel like it captures a lot of what my life feels like, which is, you know, problem solving and, uh, you know, writing code feels like The Martian soundtrack. And you're a big optimist, so the aspirational yeah. thing. And exactly. You're He's so Slytherin, you guys. He's like the most Slytherin of Slytherin. In terms Slytherin. of ambition. Yes. Yeah. So uh, it's also fitting that you would have that aspirational, yep. ambitious thing exactly. happening. Um. I, I listen to the soundtrack of uh, The Martian a lot. I listen to the soundtrack of The Social Network a lot, which has also got this sort of bouncy sort of technological sound to it. Uh, 
the social network sounds a little more like a tragedy a lot, so that is probably not it. Yeah, yeah. your your life has not been a Sad great big tragedy, no, which no, is that's which is good. Good yeah. for you, man. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, um, that's a great question, you guys. I love that. Yes. Uh, okay, keep going. So this is the moment where we start changing things up because Hollywood. So <sighs> we got Lewis. Uh, Lewis tries to do the thing that Beck wanted to do in the book, not just go out and get him, but specifically to detach from the, the tether. Uh, she's, you know, considering. Uh, we have, of course, the Iron Man scene, which in the book was absurd. He never would have been able to pull it off. Of course, they have to do the Iron Man scene. In it's annoying. The movie. Yeah, it's, it is annoying. And it's not, you know, it's not real. Like, you would not be able to control that. He would just be flying around in random, you know, spirals. Uh, and I get it. Like, I, the thing that I do totally get is who is it that is, who is working the tether? Um, uh, Vo uh, Vogel, Morgan Vogel, yeah, yeah, he's he's the one who's sitting there doing like physics by feel, mm -hmm. and you can't really portray that yeah. in a movie. Like, not you can't do it yeah. well, and so I get it. You have to do something else. Yeah, but the idea that Lewis would be like undo the tether yeah. is just like, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's just they also, uh, I think needed Mark to participate because that's one thing that doesn't really happen in the books is he just gets rescued. Like it's an entire book about him solving problems and then he gets into space and he does nothing. He just gets rescued. And so I feel like they needed that last moment of Mark does a thing yeah. to save himself. And then we get Lewis is the one to save him. So her arc of redemption is complete. And then we do the one thing that that does give us, which is, you know, pretty spectacular in the literal sense of being a spectacle is the the orbiting each other holding on to the cable uh was an interesting sort of this is not a thing that can happen anywhere other than zero g and it was especially because we've done gravity earlier in the synthesis and there's that scene where uh, George Clooney gets to the end of a cable and then it just like stretches out and he's like trying to hold on to it and you're going, why, what, that's not how that works. Right. I appreciated that in this scene, they are also desperately trying to hold on to a cable, but it's because of the centrifugal force that they are each exerting on the other one. They're sort of trying to pull each other in while also orbiting each other and thus naturally trying to push each other apart. And just the objective is get tangled up. That is how you're going to save yourself, is you just try to worm it into every like arm and leg and just get tangled up so you can't fly apart. And then finally they come together, and that and, was fun. And she brings him back to the ship, and yep. what happens? What happens that doesn't happen in the, in, in the book? As he specifically <laughs> says in the book, if this were a movie, they would all greet me in the airlock. And I'm sure the screenwriter just saw that and went, can do. <laughs> like that. Yeah. Yep, I will do that. Thank you. And yeah. That it is, was, uh, but know, before he even fine. gets into the airlock, or I guess around the time he gets into the airlock, I have to say, Houston, this is Hermes actual. We got him. That hit. Like we already knew that they got him, and yet hearing Johansson's voice over the speakers at NASA, we got him. And she says it with this sort of like squeak to her voice that is just like so. You can tell the tension is breaking. And then everybody erupts and everybody, yeah, that they did that perfectly. And I love the crowd scenes. Yeah. The crowd scenes of humanity being there for this and getting excited about this and just being nervous. Yeah. You know, I, I'm, I'm all about people, you guys. Mm -hmm. I just really love people. <laughs> and um, I enjoy watching people come together. Yeah. to, you know, they've got no control. And feeling helpless is actually something that humans are particularly bad at. Real bad. And so the fact that we get to see crowds of people coming together who are totally helpless, unless you're religious and pray, I guess. Yeah. But that's it. That yeah. Those are the only people who might not feel totally helpless. And mm -hmm. even so, I think those people often do, which is why you take that action, right? right. So... I I enjoyed I enjoy mm -hmm. the crowd scenes. They did exactly what I needed them to do. They yeah. were as good to me as the book. Mm -hmm. I will stop talking about it. We did 
get one thing here that we specifically said we wanted from the books, and I'm so glad they did it in the movies, which is Earth. He oh. gets back to Earth. We get a little epilogue. It's not just, hey, I'm back on the Hermes. I'm so grateful to the people who saved me. The oh end. Oh, my gosh. We get him on Earth. It and doesn't just end. Yeah. And by the way, this is interesting. And, you know, weigh in in the comments and let me know if you agree, because I'm, I'm open to just this being an invention of my brain. But when, when Matt Damon is sitting on that bench on Earth, he looks like Andy Weir. He, the, way they, the way they do his hair and stuff, like I don't know if it was a choice or if they just kind of look a little bit alike. I mean, he's more handsome than Andy Weir. Like uh, Andy Weir, if you ever watch this, Matt Damon is more handsome than you, I'm sorry. Uh, but I don't think he's gonna be hurt. Apparently, yeah. he, the heart throbs, so who's gonna be hurt? Shh. <laughs> <laughs> Shush. Um, but yeah, there's something about the way they, they sort of dress him and the way, you know, just like they frame his face and his hair and everything. He kind of looks like Andy Weir. And I wonder if that was a choice or if I'm just making that up. Uh, the thing that confused me yeah. was we get to Earth and it says day one. Yeah. And I'm like, wait. Well, yeah, they don't explain it immediately, but it's, they, they, they it's get there. Day one of the program? Of his class. He's, he's teaching a class and it's. Yeah, it's the beginning of the school year, basically. I, to me, it didn't feel like the first time he was teaching this class. No. No, not even remotely close. Also, one of those extras was wearing a high school letterman jacket in the astronaut program. Yeah. <laughs> She's like in the front row. Yeah. And I'm like, wait, wait, wait. I'm sorry. What? <laughs> um, I, I had a high school letterman jacket. I want to know, uh, please weigh in in the comments on this. Are Letterman jackets just an American thing? Um, I, I kind of can't think of Middle America without Letterman jackets. Yeah. Though I think they're falling out of favor yeah. over time. But I definitely, I had my my varsity letter for debate. Yes, I did. <laughs> oh, and um. banned. <laughs> um, but I just I thought it was really funny. It was yeah. really goofy because you would be so so far removed from high school that I don't think you'd be wearing your Letterman jacket yeah. and I could not get over it. I have a whole thing in my notes about it. Okay. Uh, I will say though that that scene where he's addressing his students, the scene overall is good. It's, it's, a, it's a nice speech and it wraps up the experience of the movie and like, yeah, that's, that's fun. But the l ending beat of that scene is no joke, one of my favorite moments in cinema history what? and I don't like I'm not saying that it should be everyone's it's it's particular to me but for a movie that is about science and again we, we've talked about how Andy Weir talked Andy Weir said that The Martian was you know a religious film for scientists it's a story where you know in the same way that when you watch like a Christian religious film Every time the hero is presented with a problem, the answer is to put your faith in God. And that's, it, it reinforces the Christian narrative of put your faith in God. And that is the Martian for science. Every time he comes up against a problem, he puts his faith in science. He addresses the problem, he approaches it, he figures out a solution, and he moves on. And that, you know, the Martian is sort of a testament to applied science, to using your knowledge. But before you do that, you have to gain the knowledge. And so there's an implicit statement of the support of learning in this story. And that's one of the reasons I love it. And I so, so, so love that the ending beat of The Martian, the last thing before the you know, ending credit sequence, is he gives this speech about surviving and about capability and about science. And then he turns to the class and he says, all right, questions? and every hand shoots up. There's just something so philosophically beautiful about ending the story with a new generation of astronauts asking questions. And they are all curious and they are all eager. Nobody is keeping their hand down. Everybody wants to know something. Everybody has questions. Everybody wants to learn. And that's how we're going into the future. This is one of the ways that we are totally just in sync and thoroughly compatible is I have this thing about education, which is I don't understand why we test or not test the way that we 
we do today, yeah. which is you take a test and you better not fail because you're not going to get to retake the test. And I don't understand why you don't just get to retake the test. Yeah. Because it's about fixing your mistake. Yeah. Well, and it's also about learning the thing. Yeah. Right. So you should be able to take the test until you've learned the thing. Yeah. You know, and maybe it's that the test kind of the equation changes. That probably that makes sense. So mm. you're not just memorizing stuff. Right. The only people that need to be tested are like essentially people that are like astronauts. Mm -hmm. You don't get to retake it when you're in space. You have right. your you're training, but you are your training requires you to test and retest and retest and mm -hmm. until you get it right. Yeah. And then you're out in the space and or whatever other job you're out in the world and you've trained for this. Mm -hmm. And in high school and like all the way through high school and college, that's not we're not training. Mm -hmm. We're doing the testing like we would in the real world. And it just drives me crazy. Mm -hmm. And so I, ag I totally agree with you. It is a beautiful moment of everyone gets to be curious. Nobody's too cool to ask a question. Yeah. Everybody, you know, he, he knows that some of these questions are going to be probably not like super scientific. It's just but how did you feel about this? They want to know. Yeah. yeah. They, they, they want to know the humanity behind what happened up there. They're going to mm -hmm. want to know the science of what happened behind, like, up there. I'm, and all of it is valid. Yeah. And I'm just sitting there going, yes, all of it is valid. <laughs> I, I have a special place in my heart for stories that just stick the landing philosophically. Like, not just with their characters and the story beats and the, you know, the plot threads, but the central thesis of the story, when that is how it ends, the Martian is one of them. Another one is uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Th for a show that is about feminism and about feminine empowerment, the finale of that show is the perfect culmination and the perfect statement about feminine empowerment. There are, there are very few stories that take their central theme and perfectly execute it in their ending. Yeah. And The Martian might be just yeah. my number one favorite. Now, I just have to say real quick that um, every so often we're going to bring up entertainment that has some controversy around it. Like I said, the Ted Lasso soundtrack, yeah. which has Mur um, Mumford and Sons, and there's controversy around that band right now. Um, Joss Whedon reasonably has plenty of controversy yep. around him. We're on board for that. That uh, We have had, had to have lots of conversations around where can we enjoy the art without necessarily um, promoting the uh, some of the artists themselves mm -hmm. because they're problematic? Um, we ca I, we still feel like we can enjoy some of these things without without it also saying, "Hey, we're here for Joss Whedon," because yeah. we're not super not. So I just I want to put that out there because that's going to come up probably yeah. multiple times through this podcast, and I will try and remind people because. Yeah. We're not going to try and drag that conversation into this, but it is worth yeah. noting. Um, there is, in the in the ending sequence, there is one interesting thing that I don't super know what to do with, uh, which is that, you know, the after all the hands shoot up, there's this, there's this montage that is sort of the better version of the cliched, you know, freeze frame and there's a paragraph about what happened to that character. We get all of the characters in the story and we get a little indication of where they went after this, but it's much more organic and interesting and fun. Uh, and it's all centered around uh, a mission launch. And it's got Martinez, so they did not refuse to send him back into space because of course he succeeded, which makes him a hero and not a mutineer. Uh, and we do get a glimpse of the fact that he's there with the Chinese astronauts, so the Chinese space agency got their side yep. of the bargain. Um, but one thing that I noticed on this watch through is this is the launch of Ares 5, not Ares 4, which means either Ares 4 was technically the rescue mission, that like they sort of re categorized it so that Ares 3 ended early and then Ares 4 was going back to get Mark and now this I mean, is Ares 5. I guess 5. they did say that they, that, you know, he took apart a bunch of their stuff. They're not going to. Yeah, he used the Ares 4 MAV, but I just, I would have thought that they would, he used the MAV and that's the end of Ares 3 and now the new mission is actually Ares 4. I, I would have thought that they would just recategorize Ares 4, but I guess not. I, I mean, I think, uh, yeah, I think that when, when the mission already has like, this is what we're doing on this mission. Yeah. 
and we've destroyed this mission, you're going to just keep the we're name. Just gonna yeah, stick like you're with not. Ares 5 and yeah. just Ares 4 never happened. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that just would be my a, guess. It becomes a piece of NASA trivia. Did you guys know there was no Ares 4? There yeah. was Ares 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, and 7, but yeah. no Ares 4. Exactly. I feel like that's yeah. exactly what it is. Yeah, that's um, fair. I will say I want Commander Lewis's house. Yeah. So Whoa. just seriously. Know that, honey. Yeah. Please work. Let's yeah. let's work towards that. I, it's awesome. The romantic in me loved the fact that Beck and Johansson. I hated it. Really? Oh, I, I loved that. It. He okay, but he's the romantic, and yeah. I'm like, I try. Yeah. I I can be, but I listen. Anybody tries to be like, oh, here's your newly delivered baby. Uh, watch this launch. No, fuck you. Yeah, but you're also not like somebody who spent their entire life building toward your career as an astronaut. I feel like anybody who is an astronaut has a certain amount of monomania. No. Listen, I've built my life towards acting. Yeah. Find find anything that is that is the equivalent. Yeah. They're like, oh, hey, we're going to do this. You, you can't go walk the red carpet, but you can do this live stream. No, <laughs> I will not. Yeah. I will not be accepting my Oscar from my hospital room. You, I will send someone in my stead. Screw you guys. I, I just like. I feel I like <laughs> well, but <laughs> you wouldn't be accepting it from their hospital room. But I bet if you were giving birth on the night of the Oscars or the, or you know, the day before the Oscars, I bet you would be watching the Oscars to see if you'd won. Unlikely. Really? Yes. Well, you're just not as sentimental as some people. What? <laughs> I'm s- I would I absolutely. Mean, I'd be so high on surgery, pay me- pain meds yeah. that there is n- no. <laughs> like, whatever whatever surgery is the equivalent of a guy giving birth, I would absolutely be in the in the recovery room, like turning on the TV to watch if I'd won the Oscar. But yeah. she's not on it. She's not like associated yeah. with the mission. Like I don't know. I don't. Yeah. I don't get it. I just remember I was sitting there going. Not in a fucking million years. Yeah. Please don't. Yeah. There's a person we missed. Okay. Mitch. Ah, yes. I love this. So we don't see Mitch at NASA. We see Mitch playing golf. Yep. And Mm -hmm. what this speaks to is that him and Teddy can work together professionally while they have to, but then Mitch is held accountable for undermining Teddy. Yeah. And all I could think was, oh, accountability is amazing stuff, no? Mm-hmm. Um, that was for all of the Americans who, like me, don't feel like accountability is happening right now in our political system. Um, and, I mean, I got really focused on this. I love that Mitch was fired. Yes. Y- yeah, I, no, we're that, sorry. That you don't get good. to be here anymore. Yeah. He, and he did the thing that led to him being rescued. It's good. He's not being prosecuted, but he is retiring. <laughs> yes. And, like, yeah. let's be honest. He's probably retiring with a fat severance. Yeah. You know, whatever. Um, I I don't feel bad for him, and I I appreciate him. I appreciate all of the choices and all of the work he put into it. I also appreciate that there is accountability, and mm-hmm. that's kind sure. of where yeah. we end. Yeah. And so, mm-hmm. oh my gosh, are we putting the Martian to rest? Yeah, I think we're done with the Martian. Yeah, we did this it, you big, guys. Big thing. Yeah. <laughs> um. Thank you yes. for for bearing with us as we do three episodes of a singular movie. Yeah. I think that it won't take as long in the future because we won't be having to compare it to the book. Exactly. Yeah, so. I think I think that we spent a lot of time comparing very specific points that if this was just a standalone movie, you would have been just like, okay, that was a cool scene. Yeah. Or so, you know, now we know. Yeah. Um, and I do enjoy comparing it to the book. There, yeah. there are oh, no, reasons I, to do it. But. Yeah, I think I think we did it right, and I'm ready to do something new. So, so. if you want to keep up with us, yep. we will put it out on socials mm-hmm. in the next couple of days, what we are going to do mm-hmm. for next week. Yep. And then you guys can find a way to watch whatever we watch. Yep. And we will be back with something new yep. not mark watney new Sorry, episode man. of the synthesis with a new thing to talk about so tune in same time same channel next week bye guys see ya <laughs>